thank you all for coming to the Lynx uh, crypto night or evening. Um, we're going to be giving a sort of introductory lecture about uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains most. So I'll sort of, we have a couple of speakers talking today and we're sort of going to cover as much as we can of the introductory part of it, uh, each one of us. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of the introduction stuff. We have, um, Rob's going to be talking about the security and then Josh is going to be talking about the exchanges and altcoins. Uh, just like a show of hands, how many people have experiences with cryptocurrency more than just heard about the word? And all exchanging some of that. Okay, so we have a pretty diverse crowd here, so. Um, also, disclaimer, this is not an info sesh telling you which ones to buy, which ones not to buy. Oh, We're just giving you guys sort of like an overview of what, um, of what you're up against when you sort of want to deal with cryptocurrency, okay? Um, unfortunately, the guy who was going to present first, the introduction part, uh, wasn't able to be here. He had a last minute family emergency. So I'm going to be taking over his part. So excuse me if I'm a little... Uh, uh, okay, so we're Lix. These are the people who organize the events. The exec committee, please put up your hands so it's sort of CS. Um, we are a group of grad students and undergraduate students that sort of put up events, kind of like this, seminar once a month. Uh, we also have activities like sports, board game night, movie nights. So we would love you guys to come out to all these events and we sort of have, yeah, so like every couple of weeks we sort of have different kinds of events. We'd love for you guys to come out and sort of enjoy these other events. It's not strictly for grad students, it's for anybody in computing, software, um, software engineering, metatronics, all that kind of stuff. So please come out to these events, we'd love to have you guys. Okay. Our website up there as well, links.cast.pmaster.ca. Yeah. Check out our site, our site is very well designed by this guy here, our tech officer. Mm -hmm. um, all our events are posted on our webpage, you can get more information as well directly on our website. We also have a Facebook group if you're interested in joining and uh, we post a lot of information, notices about events, seminar talks and so on on our Facebook group as well. Okay, so cryptocurrencies is something that you probably hear a lot about on and off, on the news, on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, you hear about it a little too much and probably a lot of you guys don't necessarily know what you're up against if you want to get involved with cryptocurrencies. So we kind of just want to give you guys an overview about it and so you guys can understand sort of what, what it means to be trading it, to be involved in it, to have an account, to so secret, private codes, all this kind of stuff. But they all mean something, so we're just going to give you an overview right here. Okay, so cryptocurrency is the overlying word for everything that involves blockchain, blockchain technology, uh, so online currency, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, all these kind of things are considered cryptocurrency. Um, they're not physical and they're all stored on computers. So in order for you guys to exchange these things, it's between people who are also involved in the network. So the network itself is a combination of computers that all hold a common ledger. We'll get into that for a second. A ledger is your way of accounting all the people who are involved in the network and also hold, hold cryptocurrencies themselves. So for example, uh, something like Bitcoin has a ledger, which is all of the people who are involved in, or all people who have an account with Bitcoin have, uh, are part of the ledger and are noted how much cryptocurrency they have in every transaction that they make. So every single person who might claim to have a Bitcoin, every single interaction he had to get to that one Bitcoin is all registered on the ledger, right? The good thing about cryptocurrencies is that you don't necessarily have to trust other people in the network. So you have the ability to sort of rely on the network because every node in the network is just as important as every other node. So for example, when you introduce a new node to the network, um, you're required to download the ledger and store it locally on your device. Once you have that ability, you, every transaction that happens gets updated on your machine as well. So when you introduce a new node to the network, uh, you end up creating the network more secure. And that's why people actually prefer it over centralized solutions because when you have a centralized solution, everything is something like a bank. It's all uh, in one place, rather than being shared amongst the users, right? And then there's a security aspect, which Rob is gonna get into, which is the, the cryptography, which actually ensures the security behind the transactions that actually happen in the network. So yeah, so this is the whole idea of having it decentralized. Actually, you know what? I don't, I'm not super familiar with these slides, so I'm just going to use the board a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so let's say you have uh, a network like Bitcoin and you would like to set up a network. So let's say everybody in this room all decided we would make one new coin, it's called LixCoin, right? And so we're all gonna participate in, in this uh, LixCoin, we're all gonna create a network. So one person, uh, each person in this class would then create, use their computer to create a node in the network. And we, let's say, create, uh, the first couple of people would create a network like this, and all of these nodes are connected to each other. Right, so that means that let's say, for example, one of uh, one of us would like to um, use this Lix coin. What they'd be able to do is they'd be able to uh, request a transaction, and then every person in this network would then be updated that transaction occurred. Right, so for example, if I want to exchange between one person and another person, you would claim that transaction, and then that transaction would be propagated across the network, and then everybody in the network would be notified at the same time. That, that comes to the whole uh, concept of not being able to lie to the network. So for example, if I would like to uh, post a transaction, so for example, double spending. I send one, bit, one Lix coin to uh, Dan, I send another one uh, Lix coin to Josh. Whichever one happened first is the one that the system is gonna believe. Because if my account only carries less than two, then one of those is gonna be wrong. It's gonna be rejected by the network and it's not gonna allow the transaction to go through. Right? Um, so people sort of take that concept and use it uh, in something called the blockchain. I think the blockchain is mentioned a little later and it requires a specific algorithm to ensure security. So the overlying idea of cryptocurrencies is the fact that it's equally distributed and everybody who enters the network has equal weight and equal importance than anybody else in the network. Okay? Uh, Bitcoin is the first one to implement this and uh, the paper was, uh, the, the idea was formalized by somebody who's unknown, Satoshi Nakamoto, who published the paper in, I think it was the UK or something. They published the paper and nobody knows if it's a single person, a group of people, but so, this concept was then taken and then implemented in multiple different ways. So Bitcoin was the first one to be it, and I guess that's why it's so expensive. Um, there are thousands more. If you guys can look at the exchanges, Josh will sort of talk about the exchanges to give you guys. So the ledgers is the ledger is where everybody, uh, where where every, everything is tracked. Right, so at the, at the first instance, somebody declared a transaction that is added to the ledger. So uh, um, when somebody else wants to, you want to transfer another Lix coin or Bitcoin from one person to another person, the ledger is then checked by all the different people in the network and then verified. And once that transaction is verified, then the transaction can actually go through. Right? New coins are introduced into the market by something called mining. Mining is the act of actually solving these transactions in a more abstract way. And if you are the first person to sort of verify these transactions, you're rewarded by some of that coin. Um, this concept is a little more difficult because it involves uh, the concept of blockchain. But the basis of it is that The basis is that you're initially um, the, the first block that holds a group of transactions uh, was declared. So let's call this the first block, right? And then once more transactions are made, they're pooled together. So every 10 minutes, they're pooled together, let's say, and they form another block, right? So let's say this is block, it could be as many, as many blocks as you want, block K. Some, something somewhere down the line, right? Along with this block, for Bitcoin specifically, is sort of an algorithm that you'd have to solve, that each computer is, is fighting to solve. Um, this helps with the timing of the chain. So uh, this mathematical equation has to be solved in order to verify it and add it onto the chain, right? All the transactions that were pooled together during that time frame then get verified and are added onto the chain to be verified transactions. So for example, if 100 transactions were, were made in the last 10 minutes, they would all be pulled together and a new uh, cryptographic hash, so a new uh, algorithm or equation is, is required to be solved. Uh, once that equation is solved, the person who solved it is rewarded by a certain amount of coins 
and the block is verified onto the chain. So right now, the blockchain for uh, Bitcoin could be hundreds of thousands of millions of blocks, right? So those are all instances or groupings of transactions that were verified along the line, right? Um, if, uh, if somebody else wants to make a new transaction, that ledger, so all those blocks, all those transactions the blocks, have to be checked, verify that the person can actually make the transaction, and then, and then the, the block will, a new block will be created uh, to be added onto the chain. So this is just, this just described, so your, your way of representing your own account, so if you own a, an account through Bitcoin or something, you would, be, uh, you would be given something called the secret code, which is your private information to your account. Uh, that is something that you hold secret, and only you have the ability to access your account if you're the only person who has that secret code. In order to receive a transaction, you have something called a public key, sorry, a secret key. A public key is something you give out onto the network, and then people can use it to then transfer funds to you. Once somebody uses your public key from their, from their private account, they would send you some kind, some amount of coin, and then that amount of coin is the transaction, which then will be added to the blockchain, to the ledger, right? If you guys have any questions, any specific questions, just throw your hand up and we'll, I'll be happy to answer them, okay? Uh, so the copying problem is the problem, the, yes? Can you go back and explain what's the problem with authorship? This, this problem? Mm -hmm. So if two people have a, a hold of a secret key, then they have multiple, then multiple people have access to the, to the, to the account. So a secret key is a way, so a secret key and a public key is a way to allow a person to access the account without uh, giving away the rights of the account. So for example, if somebody, if somebody holds a... Yeah, go ahead. It's a way to verify, right? Because we're dealing with a distributed on a decentralized network. Because we're dealing with a decentralized network, we don't have one central authority saying that this person or this transaction is valid itself. Because we have this public key, private key system, we're able to determine whether the true owner of an account is sitting making that transaction or not. Otherwise, Anyone can say, for example, I can say, Josh just sent me $100, even though he never said that. But because I don't have a private key, I don't have the, I don't have a way to sign this transaction in order to make it a valid transaction. Therefore, we have this kind of private key, public key system. Yeah. We'll cover all that a little more in depth. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, more, it's more related to the security behind Rob, it. So they have to the, the, the hatch that has happened yeah. to it. It's just a really high level where Rob's going to go through some of this more yeah. security stuff. But the basis, the basis of cryptocurrencies is that idea of a decentralized ledger. So everybody has access to this ledger, everybody has access to all the transactions. You can go online and look at every transaction that ever happened between any account and Bitcoin. And that sort of um, transparency is what, is what people might favor cryptocurrencies over centralized solutions. So your ability to sort of access all of these and sort of see where funds are moving between one another, that, that idea is what is the bottom, is the basis of, of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so the copying problem um, is the idea of propagating multiple multiple transactions into the network, and then trying to uh, sort of create two transactions that, that conflict based on the amount of coins that a certain point the certain person had. So if you try to propagate a transaction into the network, try to declare that I'm transferring you know one Bitcoin from from me to another person in one way, in one direction of the network. So for example, if I propagate it, so from the other picture that we have, where you sort of have, you have your network. If I try to propagate one transaction this way and one transaction this way, this one might receive it at different, at different times. So it's gonna receive two different transactions. But the one that happened first is the one that's gonna, the one that has the, the first timestamp is the one that's actually gonna be Verified and added onto the blockchain, right? Yeah. So you're talking you're talking about double spending. Yes. So maybe, yeah. So so maybe just to make a bit clearer. Um, you're talking about the fact like you have like a hash that that is like your Bitcoin, right? And then what's to stop somebody from being like, oh, I give you this Bitcoin, right? But then you still have that hash, you still have that information. 
and then you just go to somebody else. Oh, I'll give you the same Bitcoin. Exactly, yeah. So it's exactly it's the idea of being able to declare one transaction towards one person and then another transaction is propagating them in different ways. The system is going to reject it because it's going to calculate that this person just doesn't actually have the, the, the sufficient funds. So yes, that's the overspending problem. Um, this we talked about, the centralization. Okay, and so the synchronization of the network happens real time. So every single time, everybody is responsible for keeping track of their own, of their own ledger, but then the system cross checks uh, with each other which, which uh, ledger is actually accurate. So for example, uh, no node can have a hold of the ledger without having all the proper transactions that all the other nodes have. So the ledger is the one thing that must be maintained at all times. Right? And that's, that's being held on the blockchain that was downloaded initially. Um, I want to just uh, talk about the, it should be a SHA-256. Okay, I think it's cut off. So the algorithm that's used by Bitcoin is called SHA-256D. And so that algorithm is the algorithm that actually makes the blockchain possible. So how does it work? How does the blockchain work? How are, how are these blocks lined up properly in one log chain? Is uh, by the use of that algorithm. So what it does is it takes, in order to solve the next block in the chain, it takes information from the previous block and then creates the question. So the, the question that each computer has to solve is created based on the last block. So that helps in not being able to solve future blocks. Right? It helps with the timing of the system. So for example, if block BK is solved and it's added onto the network, then block BK plus one takes information from BK, so the time it was solved, the number of transactions in it, uh, and so, and it creates the, the new hashing algorithm or the new hashing question in BK plus one based on that information. And so you're not able to solve future blocks in the chain and verify transactions that have not yet been done. Right. That's, that was it in terms of the introduction to it. So blockchain and the idea of the ledger. Um, next we'll have Rob talk about security. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so just to be clear, what we're going to be talking about isn't really anything along the lines of how do I keep my coins safe, like what's best practice for security. We're going to be talking about off center. Uh, we're going to be talking about the underlying security principles of the protocol itself, and yeah, how the security is built in. So when you are uh, creating a system and you want to make it secure. It's usually good to start with asking yourself a few uh, questions. So when, if you're building a blockchain, for example, you might ask yourself, how can we ensure that every wallet's coins are safe? How can we stop people from falsely denying a transaction? How can we be sure that no one can spend more than they have? Guy touched on that a little bit. How can we stop attackers from altering the state of the blockchain? These are all good questions, everything that needs to be addressed, uh, and probably way more as well. Uh, it's also a good idea to to pose a scenario, an attack scenario to yourself if you're trying to defend a system. So we can imagine a simple attack scenario here. Let's say Alice agrees to sell a car to Bob for one Bitcoin. Sounds about accurate these days. Bob then, okay, so their transaction might go a little bit like this. Bob transfers one of his Bitcoins to Alan, Alice. Alice will then ship her car to Bob. And then after this occurs, after Bob gets the car, he might then try to go back and alter the blockchain so that he never sent his Bitcoin to Alice. He still has his Bitcoin and he has a car. So we're gonna look at what's implemented in the, with a little bit of focus on Bitcoin, but in blockchains in general, what they implement in order to stop sort of behavior like this. So.
So um, we're going to start by looking at some low-level, we won't get into the nitty-gritty, but we're going to look at low-level uh, cryptographic primitives. These first two we have here, cryptographic hash functions and digital signatures, these are what we call cryptographic primitives, meaning that they're like building blocks that you can build secure applications from. And then the proof of work puzzle is something that's common in, I think, most um, ledger systems, blockchains. So, and this builds off of hash functions, so we'll get to that after we cover these two. All right, a hash function. Um, essentially, starting off simple, hash function takes as input a string of, actually, you know, this takes a, takes as input a string of arbitrary lines, so you can feed a hash function a string any size, and you're going to always get an output that has the same length, some length k, and this output of the hash function is called the hash of the input, and these hash functions are used in cryptography all over the place, they're used in signature schemes, encryption, basically everything, but the most common use for hash functions is for providing this uh, security concern of integrity. And what that means is, if you want to ensure integrity of a message, you want to be able to check that the message hasn't been altered in any way. How you do this is feed your message into the hash function. Here you have MD5, that's an old, outdated hash function. And it's going to spit out the hash. So then later you can send your message and the hash. Someone can hash the message again. Make sure they get the same thing. Um, you may have heard of hash functions from, uh, what is it, hash tables or something similar. In the setting of cryptography, uh, it's really important to make a distinction. Hash functions need to have a few more properties in order for them to be consider considered uh, secure and usable. Uh, there's about five or three, it's disputable, but two of the ones that are important in this setting are collision resistance. And so what this means is that, well, let's actually, so if I have some hash function, call it H, then it should be hard for you to find two values, M1 and M2, that when hashed produce the same output. So this is one property that's of the utmost importance, collision resistance. Pre-image resistance is pretty similar. And it's that if I give you some y, which is the result of running the hash function with some input, you shouldn't be able to tell me what the input was. It should be extremely difficult. Um, now obviously because we're going from arbitrary input domain, arbitrary length input domain, sorry, to a restricted input domain, this bit stream of length k, it's impossible to, to make it so that there won't be any collisions. But this restriction simply says that it should be sufficiently difficult for you to come up with any collisions. Um, and so with these two, is anything unclear so far? What could go wrong if a collision happens? Uh, well, actually in the blockchain setting, it's not exactly clear. It's more troublesome if you have a pre-image um, corruption or whatever. But in other settings, collision resistance are, there's actually case of, there was uh, malware a few years ago, it was called Flame, if anyone wants to look it up. And this was devastating malware that hit like globally. And the reason it was able to install itself on Microsoft co computers was because the uh, whoever programmed the malware, they were able to forge a Microsoft signature, we'll talk about signatures in a second, because they found an MD5 collision. And so since then, that's why people don't use MD5 anymore. Um, Right, so given these two properties, it's we can see that hash functions have this sort of behavior where they behave like seemingly random. It's deterministically random, because every time you feed it an input, you're gonna get the same output, but you have no way of telling how it arrived at that output. It's just gobbledygook here. We just have this random X string. So basically they just turn input and give you whatever. So now, in a blockchain, how is a uh, hash, fun hash function used? How does it give us any security? Well, 
first and foremost, um, every, every block in the chain contains the hash of the previous block. And they do this so you can uh, confirm the validity, like confirm that the block is canonical, that it relates correctly to the previous blocks. And this offers security because if someone, let's say you bought, let's say you owned Bitcoin 2013 when it was whatever, 100 bucks, and then you sold it when it went up to 1,000, a few months or days, whatever, later it was 2,000, you were kicking yourself, you wanted to go back, let's uh, edit the blockchain so that I never sold my Bitcoin. Uh, you would be able to do this because you would have to essentially, here they have the previous hash, you'd have to essentially make sure this previous hash matches the block that you changed the transaction in, and then it propagates all the way through the blockchain. So it's just not realistic. This is kind of an oversimplification of, of the security measures for the blockchain itself. We'll get into that a little more when we talk about the uh, proof of work. Um, right, high functions, as I said before, they're also used to the signatures, which we'll talk about now, and the yeah, proof of work. Um, so talking about digital signatures, it's probably best to start off with an analogy. I'm sure most of you have heard of encryption and like understand to some degree how encryption works. If, uh, if Guy and I want to communicate over the net to each other and we don't want anyone to know what the hell we're talking about, then we're going to use some encryption scheme. Well, first and foremost, we're going to decide on a secret key, something only he and I know, some secret key key. And then if I want to send a message to Guy that no one can read, I'm going to encrypt my message with K. And that will give me something that's unreadable to the human eye, right? Some ciphertext C. And then I can send that over the wire to Guy. And Guy's going to receive C, and he's going to run some corresponding decryption algorithm over the met, uh, sort of C that he receives and the secret key K that we agreed on. And then when he does that, he's able to read the message. Um, this type of encryption scheme is what we call a symmetric key encryption scheme because Guy and I have the same key. Uh, following this, there was a, a sort of a new paradigm introduced known as asymmetric key cryptography. And basically how this works, Guy and I are gonna both run a key generation algorithm, right? And instead of just having one secret key K, I'm going to have, so Rob's going to run key gen. Let me know if I mean, you can't read this. Um, and this is going to give me a secret key or a private key and a public key. And this is where the secret and public key comes from in the, uh, the signing mechanism of blockchain. And so if Guy wants to send me a message, what he's going to do is he's going to run the encryption algorithm with my public key and his message. And that's going to give this ciphertext here. And then when I get his ciphertext, I'm going to run it with the decryption algorithm with his ciphertext and my secret key. And the secret key and the public key are mathematically related in such a way that, without getting into too much detail, um, it's, it's extremely difficult to know what the secret key is given the public key, but given the secret, am I saying this right? Given the public key, it's extremely difficult to determine the secret key. But given the secret key, it's trivial. So, okay. So that's for ensuring confidentiality of a message, if you don't want someone to read your message. Now, when we're talking about digital signatures, they work in the same way. It's also an asymmetric scheme. Only now, what we're trying to achieve, instead of confidentiality, is something known as authenticity. Somebody wants to make sure that if I send a message, it was actually me who wrote the message. So how this works, instead of encryption and decryption, decryption algorithms, we have these analogous algorithms. Uh, I'll sign, I'll give it a message, and I'll give it my secret key, and it's going to give us some signature 
And then if someone wants to verify that it was me who wrote this message M, they're going to take the verify algorithm. They're going to feed in the message. Of course, it can be encrypted too. They're going to feed in my public key. And they're going to feed in the signature. And it'll just tell them yes or no. I did write the message and verify the message, or I didn't. So, um, right, it should uh, be starting to become clear that in the blockchain now, the only time you can move your coins, the only time you can uh, perform a transaction is if it's validly signed using your secret key. All the coins are stored in the ledger according to a public key, and that's how it's extremely easy to verify. They just run the verification algorithm with your uh, signature that you've attached to your message, you're going to submit a message to the network that says I'm sending five Lix coins to uh, to Guy, and then you're going to sign that message and that's going to be appended, and then whoever's mining the block to add it to the blockchain is going to be able to easily val uh, validate if that was you or not. So we should keep our private key secure and make sure it's, all this Yeah, it's important that the private key is indeed private. Um, what am I writing here? Right, so user A is going to sign some message or a document with their private key, authorizing that, yes, I approve this message. And then anybody else who has the public key, you just send your public key out on the network because it doesn't compromise your private key at all, and anyone can confirm whether or not it was you that sent the message. Right, so I mentioned cryptocurrency can only be validly transferred if it's signed. Uh, the only person who can sign it is the person who has the private key. <coughs> so, therefore, if you're assuming that the underlying signature scheme you're using is it works and it's secure, and whatever else it depends on, then you can. It's reasonable to assume that if your private key is private, you are the only one who can send out your coins, or you have complete control, basically, of the state of your coins. Again, there's a few assumptions there, but. Most of the signature schemes in use are, uh, well actually we can talk about the security of those in a bit. Alright, proof of work. Uh, let's jog my memory for a second. Right, so uh, we talked about it a little bit in Guy's segment. In order to, for someone, they're called miners, to add a new block to the blockchain, they need to kind of successfully complete this game here, which is mining a block. And how this works is, So you have your state of the block, you know, your previous hash, whatever, all your transactions. And you're going to hash the header. Uh, Bitcoin uses SHA-256. Guy mentioned SHA-256D, that's just two applications, double SHA-256. Um, so you're going to hash the block header using your favorite hash function. You're going to get Y, that's the first step of this game. And then what miners have to do is they have to find some number N, such that when they concatenate it with the hash of the block, it has some property. Usually, I think in Bitcoin, I don't know about other cryptocurrencies, it needs to start with some uh, leading number of zeros. You know? right. And um, so the reason that they include this Y is so that, well, if they didn't, you'd just be finding a number that starts with so many zeros and you could just sit there all day and you know look for hashes that start with so many zeros and then once it's your turn to mine a new block or whatever, you just say, oh, here's this one. But because it's dependent on the current block, that's why you can't just like skip ahead. Yeah. Any idea why do we need those zeros? It's just arbitrary. It's just to come it's, up with some difficult The reason is procedure. that when you have a resulting hash, it needs to be of a specific length. So I believe you input, um, they take an input of 160 bits, and your output has to be either vice versa, 160 or 256, which is the name behind the algorithm. And so in order for you to, to you receive something back, and it has to be of a certain value in order for it to be proper a, a proper output. So they padded with zeros in order to make it that proper length. Right? The more zeros, because these hash algorithms are apparently random, the more zeros you add, it gets uh, exponentially more difficult yeah. to, to find the solution because, um, I think we have it here on this next slide. 
Right. So if we take SHA-256, for example, as 256 output, if you try to find a specific output from that, you have 2 to the 256 chance, or not chance, but you have to run it that many times to ensure you're going to find the specific output. Um, so if you're trying to find an output with n zeros, that's going to take maximum 2 to the n guesses, which if you're looking for 50 n, I think that's what they used, maybe started with Bitcoin or they were out at some point. That's uh, whatever the hell that is. That's like a thousand trillion. What is that? Gillian? Um, that's that many applications of SHA-256. It's not a difficult algorithm to run, but it's not a small number either. And uh, this, this number here, 50, is what's known as the difficulty. And every so often this goes up, so you have to find a new number with an extra amount of zeros. And that's to ensure, because there's always more miners joining the network, they're going to have a higher chance of finding these numbers more frequently. So they increase the difficulty to keep the, uh, the network growing at the same rate. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. This is what people were able to get so rich early on in Bitcoin. Because the difficulty was so low, if you have a computer introduced into the network trying to mine, you have a very high chance of actually guessing the block right and winning a lot of coins mm -hmm. as a reward for solving the guess. Yeah. Who increases the difficulty? So it's 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 uh, it's it's just part of the protocol. It's, it's built, built in. The code. It's built into the system. Yeah. Okay. So every you can look right now and you can see that the next increase in difficulty and decrease in reward is going to be in however many blocks. And so back in you know, 2013, when you know nobody was in the network, you can have your own computer, your own laptop in your office, and it'll be mining at uh, sufficient rates to receive high amounts of coins. Right now, you know, people have factories in China that are running huge amount of hash rates. So if your your computer becomes insignificant relative to the network, to the total hash rate. Right. So that's sort of what 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 Rob is sort of the relevance. Right. Uh, and it's actually funny, if you look, you, there's websites you can go on and look at like the previous history of, of Bitcoin to track all the coins in the network basically and like the first so many blocks were just whoever, the Satoshi guy who created it, you know, awarding himself 50 blocks as he's finding these hashes, probably just got a crazy amount of Bitcoins, sort of, living in Fuji or something. So when you say guess, what are we guessing? Like, what are we guessing? Like, what we're guessing this end, we're just taking stabs at end. Like you can just go zero, one, two, three until you find something that satisfies this condition here, or you can throw darts at a board. Yeah. What does a hash rate quantify? Sorry. What does a hash rate quantify? Quantify. Yeah. And what is it telling you? The the hash rate is the total number of guesses everybody in the network is attempting. So like every ah, single right, right. every single time you so, guess that number, you use your something called a nounce. You take a nounce, you add it on to the previous block, like Rob mentioned, the information from the header, you combine it and feed it into the hash, hashing algorithm. Right? You it, it computes the, the hashing the hash, whatever whatever your result is, and it checks, is this the is this the one you're looking for? And the network will tell you no. So you try a different nouns. Combine it with the header and try it again. Everybody's trying it at the same time and competing to be the first person to guess the right the right result. Right? Once somebody guesses that right result, they are rewarded with solving that block and are given, I think right now it's 12 and a half bitcoins per correct block. Right? So if you have a computer and you end up guessing the right nouns, uh, which will then result in the right hash you know, through the computation, then you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll win that uh, amount. So if you look at the total hash rate right now in Bitcoin, I don't know what the number is, but it's, it's massive. Right, and so like other coins might have a smaller hash rate because there's just less people trying at that hash. Yeah, it's just indicative of how many people are mining. So it's in times per second, then, right? It, yeah, I think this is probably for sure. I don't know. Got it. Yeah, things per second. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Why are we trying to make this one hot? Sorry. Why are we trying to make this one hot? The hash rate. I. Nobody, the only thing that controls the hash rate is the popularity of the coin. No, why, why are you trying, trying to make it hard? Oh, why are you trying to make it hard? Um, well, different coins have different difficulty. And they have different block rates, the rate at which blocks are added. 
and look. Actually, if we um, if we think back to, I think yeah, this this is a problem we talked about at the beginning between Bob and Alice, where he tries to cheat the system by reconstructing the blockchain without his transaction. Um, it becomes basically infeasible, astronomically improbable, that he's able to do this because of the difficulty of this problem. I don't know if we skipped anything on this side, but no, we should be. So yeah, so going back to that problem, Bob versus Alice, or Bob versus Bitcoin, I guess. Um, he, if he wants to, okay, so let's actually, so there's this concept in cryptocurrency is known as forking where because multiple people are trying to mine new blocks, inevitably you're going to get people mining new valid blocks at the same time. So we have some canonical sequence, and then at some point you're going to have two people who come up with new blocks. And how you decide what the canonical stream is, is whichever one uh, has the most work done on it. Basically whichever one is currently looking for the longest stream of zeros. That's the one you personally pick up and say, oh, this is what everyone's using. Um, so if Bob wants to follow through with this attack, he's going to come, let's say they're traveling down this path here. He's going to come back here where his transaction to Alice was, and he's going to say, I'm going to try and mine from this block without my transaction. I'm just going to take someone else's random transaction. And he has to basically get his line, his fork, longer than the one everyone else is using in order for everyone else to listen to him, in order for his attack to be successful. Uh, what this means, basically, is that he's going to need at least 50% of the computing power on the network in order to succeed in overpowering, overmuscling everybody else. Um, so in a nutshell, this is kind of the, uh, the final security parameter of a cryptocurrency network, of a, of a blockchain system, is that they make this assumption that at least half of the computing power on the network belongs to non-malicious users. If this isn't the case, then this attack we talked about between Bob and Alice is trivial. Why does it matter? Why does it have to be half? Um, why does it have to be half? Well, if you make a fork at the same time, it's, it's just a race. If you, what if you don't make a fork at the same time? What if you try to fork one of the other blocks? Then it would need to be more than half. It would need to be a huge amount because you're competing against all the blocks that have already been created as long as all the ones that are going to continue to be created. The reason it's half is because it's just a race. If you're marginally faster than who you're racing against, you'll beat them. And eventually you catch up to them, right? So therefore, if less than True. half yeah. the computing power Yeah, so even if you go back far. Yeah, it doesn't matter how far back, there's no time limit to it. As long as you have more than half the computing power, you can eventually grow your chain to be longer than the, than the honest or the true chain. Yeah. In which case, your malicious chain would take over of that. Original chain. It's a good point. Yep. Uh, so I'm not sure if you know about this. Um, uh, what are you explaining? I, I heard something about the, like let's say you did have 50 percent or more of the computing power. Um, there is some sort of incentive. That, I don't know if you heard about this to, to just continue doing honest stuff afterwards. Because right. like you you either you can either try. And be like, okay, I'll fork a new like malicious chain, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that, like you could also just be like, okay, I'll fork a chain and I'll be honest about it. You get some <laughs> coins back somehow. Do you know how? Yeah, it's the it's chain? just a uh, block reward. It's written into the protocol. Every time someone okay. mines a block successfully, there's a uh, one transaction that's added to the block that says this miner gets what well, you said it's twelve point five bitcoin. Right, right, right now it's twelve point five, but it changes. Right. Yeah. Um, so. So even yeah. if you did have that computing power, there's, there's an still an incentive to, just to behave like, oh, honestly. No, but I'll just yeah. continue believing things. Exactly. But that incentive's only valid if the coin's worth something, right? right. But right. if the coin's not worth something, is someone going to spend their time you know, cheating anyways, the system? Right. Probably not. Yeah. So all in all, the security on the system depends on the security of the underlying hash function, the security of the digital signature scheme. This assumption, which is pretty safe to make because if the coin's worth something and someone's willing to go through with this attack, they're probably just as likely to behave honestly and get some coins out of the deal. Um, threats, however. There are some threats looming in the distance. Um, hash functions, 
for example, I uh, mentioned MD5 and, and SHA-1 as well, the one that came before SHA-2, have both been shown there's been collisions displayed and they're just not used anymore. There's been disastrous problems from people continuing to use something like MD5. So if there ever comes a day when SHA-256 is broken, which is completely plausible because these sort of primitives don't have any formal proof for their security, it's just like, yeah, this is good, sure. If it's ever broken, then every system that uses it or whatever other sh hashing algorithm they use is going to have to migrate to uh, some other hashing algorithm. And I think Satoshi mentioned in his original paper that it's, it's possible. I, I read briefly that there is some mechanism in the protocol that can allow this. I don't know how easy it is or if it's, it's likely to create a fork or not. I can't speak on that. But other than that, Ethereum, you may have heard, plans to migrate to this proof of stake. Uh, implementation opposed to a proof of work, where basically you say, I have this much stake in the system, I have this much Ether, which is the Ethereum equivalent of Bitcoin. So um, I'm going to stake it in hopes of mining a successful block and getting more Ether. And so in that case, no one's doing, no one's running hashes. They're not, I don't know the full details on this, but it gets really dependency on the hash. Sorry? I think it's like a voting thing. Is it like voting? The whoever has more ether stake, they'll have a higher voting percentage. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so the other thread, some of you may have heard uh, quantum computers, the potential of large scale quantum computer poses disastrous consequences for most asymmetric cryptography, which is that private key, public key dichotomy we were talking about. Um, Bitcoin signature algorithm is this elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. It would be just completely destroyed by a quantum computer. So, and I, I doubt there's any cryptocurrency that uses a quantum safe signing algorithm. It's just not really feasible at the moment. But uh, if a quantum computer was ever, and it's not uh, incredibly unlikely, some estimates range to like 2035 or something, that could be a large scale quantum computer, then any cryptocurrency would need to migrate to something that's quantum safe. There's a whole subfield of cryptography called post-quantum cryptography. Um, Hash-based signatures are a specific uh, field of this, subfield of this that has some uh, good groundwork, so that might be a candidate for them to move to. And yeah, that basically wraps up what I want to say. Okay, let's take a break. Um, there's food and stuff right here. Uh, sorry, we're really running over time, but it's we'll just do like... A Five to ten minute break, we'll reconvene at 3.35, so Guy and Rob will give you an idea of a general overview of what cryptocurrencies are, what blockchains are, kind of the security behind it, and some of the threads. And then afterwards, after the break, Josh will talk about how can you actually buy cryptocurrencies. Now, Josh and I will talk a little bit about some of the exchanges, so kind of more of a consumer perspective, perspective, where if you want to buy Bitcoin, or if you want to buy Ethereum, how do you go about doing that? And what are some kind of old coins which are out there, right? So instead of buying uh, 15,000 uh, Canadian Bitcoin, what if you want to buy something that's a little bit cheaper? Because we're all students, so we all student loans, and you know. All right, so what is an, ex an exchange? It is a place where you can either buy Bitcoin and Ethereum, or you can use Bitcoin and Ethereum to buy other what's called altcoins. And these altcoins, it's sort of a loose definition, but it's basically anything that's not Bitcoin and Ethereum. Can you give us an idea of how many altcoins there are, roughly? There's like several hundred that people like usually care about. But uh, I, mean, I, so I could make one and it would be called an altcoin. I could make one tomorrow, I could make one in like 20 minutes. There's apparently sites that'll make them for you. Like meme generator sites, but for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, fiat currencies are just anything that's backed by government, so like Canadian dollars, US dollars, um, different exchanges do different things. So Coinbase is one that usually only does like Canadian or US dollars to Bitcoin or Ethereum. They do Bitcoin Cash now and Litecoin. Um, other exchanges like Binance and uh, Quadriga also let you go between those coins and other altcoins. So if I want to buy one of the altcoins, I'll have to go to one of these exchanges rather yeah. than go to a specific, rather than go to... Yeah, so you'll go to one to put money in, and then you go to another one to move it into another coin. So we talked about fiat. Um, so there's 
every exchange you make is going to be a pair of coins. So it's either going to be like CAD Bitcoin or Bitcoin Ethereum or like Bitcoin Ripple or something. And we talked about how there's different types of exchanges. So why are we trading in pairs then? Well, because you have to buy with something to get something else. Okay, and then how many pairs, or how are pairs typically determined? It's kind of trade between any altcoin pair and any other altcoin? So, or it's or whatever, the there's usually enough, uh, like a state, like Bitcoin is somewhat stable, which is a relative term in this world. Um, and it's been around long enough, so a lot of people have it, and so a lot of exchanges choose Bitcoin as the source and sort of the intermediary coin to use. Because I guess it's well, well established? Yeah, and, and Ethereum is becoming like Bitcoin was like a year ago, so it's starting to be used for more trading pairs. Okay. So there are kind of certain major cryptocurrencies, if you will, which are more popular, more well established that people use. As Relatively a stable rate. too, yeah. Right. Okay. So if you want to get started on an exchange, you have to create an account first, obviously. Then you have to get your account verified. Now most exchanges want you to do that because they don't want to be accused of supporting money laundering. So they want at least uh, proof of your address and that's also proof of your name then. Uh, some will want uh, pictures of your driver's license for that, or utility bills, um, some want like a, a selfie of you with a utility bill or something like that. And then I guess somebody looks at this data or maybe there's a way to do it automatically. Maybe using machine learning algorithms and some yeah, machine learning or image recognition stuff. Then you'll have to deposit funds. So you can't usually make a, a trade from a wallet that you have, you have to move stuff onto the exchange and then the exchange holds your funds and you transfer from that to something else and back or whatever you want to do. And then when you make the exchange, you end up with the result of that exchange on the exchange. So if I bought Ripple with Bitcoin, I lose that amount of Bitcoin and I end up with whatever amount of Ripple I bought. Good job. Yep. So is the movement from your wallet to the exchange an actual transaction? So from your wallet to the exchange is a transaction on like the network. So if you did Bitcoin, it's a Bitcoin transaction. If you did Ethereum, it's an Ethereum transaction. Right. On the exchange though, what you have, it says you have a wallet, but it's not really a wallet. It's like they have a large pool of money and they give you an IOU for that money. And you're just basically trading those IOUs. So it's generally a bad idea to leave all your money on exchange because if the exchange got hacked and somebody took their pool of money, that includes your money too. Just to build upon that, the reason why you don't have an individual address on exchange is because if you think about some of the larger exchanges for within the crypto space, there is a huge amount of transactions going on every single time. If all those transactions were being done on the blockchain itself, that would really clog up the blockchain itself. So rather, rather than that, they have their own kind of internal ledger, if you will, that keeps track of which user traded which coin for which others use other coin and so on. And also for Bitcoin, especially, I mean, the fees were 20 bucks just recently. 50. Yeah, and they went up a lot. 50, I think. And an exchange like Binance allows you to trade up to, down to about like $20 US worth of Bitcoin. So if you wanted to do that and pay the fees, you'd be paying 40 bucks to make that transfer. Right, so that's kind of one of the things we kind of glossed over where each of these transactions, withdrawing or trading or funding an account, there's some kind of a, a fee associated with it, right? Where you can't, yeah. the, the people behind this, they need to somehow make money. So any kind of transaction, there's usually some kind of a percentage fee related with it. And uh, so like we mentioned with Bitcoin, that fee, that minimum fee is, was around like $40 or so, which means that regardless of how big or how small amount of money you're trying to fund an account with or to withdraw from an account, you're going to lose 40 bucks. So if you're putting in $20 and the fee is $40, that's not really worth your money. And it's, it's how the miners get paid in a proof of work uh, system. There's also a proof of stake where the verification of the transactions is done and the amount of money you hold of that coin determines the importance of you verifying it. So if you have, if you were to have like 30% of the coins in a proof of stake coin, then your word saying it's a valid transaction is worth more than someone who has like 1%. And the way you do that is you lock in these funds this is sort of diverging from our introductory talk. You lock in these funds, it's called staking, and then they give you a reward periodically, like dividends if you are familiar with stocks, for keeping it locked in like that. Uh, so when you're making an exchange, you issue an order. That order is either a buy or a sell order. 
and it's for an amount of a number of coins at a price. And your order has to be matched by an equivalent opposite order. So if you're buying, there has to be a sell order for that price and that amount. Otherwise, it's either not going to happen or it's going to only happen partially. So your order can sit in the order book for? As long as it takes for the price and the amount to happen. And there's a metric called volume, which is the number of, the, of trades in that, in Bitcoin usually, over like a 24 hour period. And the higher the volume, the more likely your trade is going to go through. So if you're dealing with a really low volume market, there's a chance that you can put in an order and there won't be an order for like 10 minutes later. But something like Bitcoin Ethereum would happen. Pretty, That's pretty awesome. Just said, but yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the order book from Binance. And the order book is a list of all the open orders. The greens are sell, uh, sorry, buy orders, and the reds are sell orders. And they're grouped by um, the lowest common digit in the price that they set. The middle number is the amount that people want to either buy or sell, and the right number is the total amount in Bitcoin. This is Ripple, right? This is Stellar versus Bitcoin. Stellar. It's 100% on Stellar. Stellar is not the same I I might have come back to Ripple. I, I forget which one this is, but anyways. The point I was trying to make is that the price that you that the exchange is going to show is 11738 but that's neither of the, uh, the lowest sell order or the highest uh, buy order. What it is, is it's the second highest buy order. So what probably happened is that somebody bought a whole bunch of coins for that price. And so the exchange says that that's now the price. We're going to see how many more people will buy it at that price. It gives you an idea of what the current price of the currency yeah. itself is. Uh, like Josh mentioned, with an order book, you have people who are making offers to buy and making offers to sell currency, right? So at the bottom here, right, we have this person who wants to buy this much Ripple at this price, which means that he will give you 0 0.137 Bitcoins for 1,166 Ripple. Now, if you want to sell at that price, you can fill his order. If you feel that this order, that he isn't giving you enough Bitcoin, you can choose to create, a, create your own sell order, which is what, for example, this person did, right? So instead of selling, instead of selling at 11,740, this person wants to sell at 11,745, and he wants to sell this, this many Ripple for a total of this many Bitcoins. So it just gives you an idea of kind of the order book, which shows you all of the current open orders, and uh, if you want to instantly carry out a transaction, you'll have to match one of these orders that are currently available in the book. Otherwise, you'll have to create your own new order. And in the case of Binance, which is where this is from, each row is not specifically one person, it's just a group of people for the yeah, same price. Yeah. So there's a few different order types, and it's the same terminology as stock markets, if you're familiar with that. There's market orders, where you give it an amount of the coin, and it just fills it at whatever the price currently is. Uh, there's limit orders, where you give it an amount and a price, and the order will only be filled if it's a buy order, and you say, I want to buy it at when the price goes up to this amount, well, it'll only fill when the price goes up to that amount. So it's essentially creating a new or entry in the order book. You're yeah. essentially creating a new entry in the order book yeah. um, with the limit orders. Yeah, and it's the or it's market yeah. orders you're filling. Yep. Yeah. So if you do a market order and the price changes, does your market order become a limit order? It's whatever. The, oh. So the as an example, mark, we'll, let's take a look at market orders and limit orders with the previous slide, right? Yeah. So if I were to, let's say I want to buy Ripple right now, and I want to fill it out at market order, that means that I take whatever the lowest selling price is, and I go at this amount. So let's say I want to buy 1,000 Ripple. I see if I go with the market order, which means I just put in 1,000 Ripple at whatever the market price tells me, I first buy 389 at this price, and then I buy the next 294 at this price, and then I buy the next uh, five, six, next 300 and, 70 or 80 something, 387 at this price. So you kind of keep on going up the current open orders until you fill your entire order, right? Whereas with the limit order, you're essentially creating a new entry within the order book. So rather than take whatever is currently available, you're saying that, okay, instead of buying it at our current price, I want to buy at this price here. So I'm going to create a new entry in the order book, but that means that your order isn't filled right away. You have to wait until someone who's willing to sell at this price in order to fill your order. But it gives you more flexibility in terms of picking out what is the price you want to buy or sell at. 
what's the market order, you're just taking whatever's available now. That's not the two main differences. And the thing you mentioned before, where you would buy different tiers at the same time, of course, if you do that, you're going to increase the price because suddenly they're gone and the average is higher now. And then the more advanced orders are uh, stop limit or sometimes called stop loss orders, where you can set it so that if the price of a coin that you have tanks, you set a threshold where, you say, if it goes down, you know, 80%. That triggers what's called a stop limit order, which at that point it'll start selling what you have with so the expectation that it might go down further. So it's a limit order with an additional limit. Yeah. Right? With a limit order, when you place it, it's in your order book right away, it can be filled right away. With a stop limit or stop loss, you have to the price has to first meet a threshold for your order to be active, for your limit order to be active. Are there any like premiums that you have to pay for that kind of automation? So that depends on the exchange itself. Some exchanges offer these functionalities, others don't. Um, but generally you don't pay for putting in an order. You only pay when the transaction happens. Right, so typically the fees themselves will be roughly the same for the different types of orders, but uh, you only pay the fee when the order itself is carried out. And then there's even more advanced, which are margin trading. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with margin trading, which essentially you're putting in some amount of um, bitcoins or some kind of uh, amount of investment, and then you can use that as kind of a leverage to borrow more money to use that to make even more risky bets, which is typically not recommended. This is what Joe's been doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not recommended. Uh, shh. Yeah. Can you do option trading? Like shorting? So, yeah. Yes, that, that's kind of the margin trading I was talking about, where some exchanges will give you the option of shorting or longing certain uh, crypt, crypt, cryptocurrencies. Again, with the crypto space, it's very susceptible to kind of pump and dump. So you want to be very careful with any kind. There, there's no SEC or any kind of um, yeah. Any, there's no kind of agency behind to make sure all the trades are proper. If you have enough money, you can drive the price up or drive the price down. So it's. Just referring to you short it. Yeah, hundred percent. percent. You look at some of the graphs and you see there's a there are definitely kind of clear patterns there. Also, we should clarify that a public method is basically fraud, but it's allowed in this system because there's Plus, no re regulation. Yeah, it's because it's not regulated, yes, yeah. anything goes. So you can also screw yourself over in that case, right? By well, you're not technically in control. You're yeah. in control of other people's votes, right? Yeah. So you may choose to say, "I'm guessing the price is going to go down, therefore I'm going to short it," and then tomorrow someone decides to buy all, all the available coins, and the price goes through the roof, and you're down a lot. Yeah. So this is relying on a trusted third party to do all these transactions. Right? Yes, you're you're essentially trusting an exchange with your cryptocurrency and your personal information. Isn't kind I know of it sounds kind of bad. But well, it seems kind of counterintuitive. Isn't isn't the idea like to remove the trusted third party mm -hmm. from the whole scenario, like cryptocurrency? Yeah. So it is a bit of centralization in a decentralized world. Yeah. But it's better than meeting random people and saying, "I want to sell you this." Many it's, coins for that. Yeah, it's a way to facilitate the transaction itself. Otherwise, how would you find someone who's willing to sell you a Bitcoin for this price or who's willing to sell you a Ripple for this many Bitcoins? Um, it's a little bit different than your typical stock markets. For example, in the, in the stock markets, your Apple stocks or your Facebook stocks will be the same price throughout all the exchanges. That's not the idea behind centralization where there's one regulated entity that controls everything. Whereas with these exchanges, if you go on one exchange, your Bitcoin might cost you $10,000 Canadian. You go to another one, it might cost you $15,000. Um, so there is no one specific price. It's more, uh, there's a price for every pair, for every pairing at every exchange. So one of the issues that uh, was really relevant kind of the last couple of months was that in Korea, they really drove up the price of Bitcoin. So I think it was two or $3,000 USD more per Bitcoin in, uh, in Korean exchanges than it was over the rest of the world. So their crypto, uh, their Bitcoin was uh, like 15 or 17,000 American per Bitcoin, whereas others were like 13 or 14,000. So if you want to, you can buy a bunch of Bitcoins on uh, the other international exchanges and then go to Korea and just, or sell those in Korea for more money in a sense. But, um, so there's no one price. It's whatever price the exchange is set it to. And also part of that is that the original intention wasn't that it would be a huge exchange game. It was that you would pay for services to a specific individual 
like you would PayPal or like any transfer now. It's just it sort of become this recent. Huge. Yeah. Coinbase had a billion dollar, they had a billion dollars in revenue. Also, so a lot of this terminology is similar to stock trading. Um, so other stock trading resources like Investopedia have adapted their online resources to cover crypto trading too. They've got definitions and tutorials and stuff like that. All right, altcoins. What are altcoins? Like I said, they're anything that's not Bitcoin and sometimes Ethereum, depending on who you ask. Uh, examples are like Neo, Stellar, Ripple. We missed the most popular one. Where's Dogecoin? Dogecoin is one too. Um, a lot of them are forks of existing coins. So Dogecoin is a fork of Bitcoin. Um, what is one of the forks? Oh, Ethereum itself is a fork of Ethereum Classic, which still exists. Um, they're not always currencies, these altcoins. Some of them are meant as payment for a system. So Ethereum is like a computer that developers can make apps for and then have it run on the computer. And what they do is they pay for the like, compute cycles with Ether, which is what people are buying trading as Ethereum. If you were a developer and you had an app, you would need to buy Ethereum to make it work. So that's kind of one of the major differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin itself. Bitcoin, there is no there's no actual value behind it. It's more used as a storage of value rather than having some actual functionality. Whereas with Ether, like Josh mentioned, you're actually able to carry out um, computer programs on the network by paying Ether. Yeah. And it just so happens that people end up using it like a currency. Which is, again, not as it's intended. You know, yeah. I need to increase my collection. So, like we said, Ethereum is a network that you can run apps on and when the app developer pays the Ethereum, they're paying it to the Ethereum miners to perform the, the work for the app. There's other platform coins out there. There's basically, if you can name an industry, someone's making a coin for it. Whether or not it's applicable is up for debate. There's people doing databases, um, identity verification. So in a similar way that um, you can verify transactions, you can also verify somebody's credentials using a blockchain, uh, asset tracking, a lot of internet of things, coins out there, and there's, I have others because there's like hundreds of them. All right, terminology, white papers. Most altcoins are released with a white paper, and all that is is basically a promise of further technology and sort of an explanation of it. And a lot of them don't have working technology when they're released. So even if they're on an exchange, they may have nothing behind them, which is why if you're going to buy altcoins, which this is not investing advice because we can't do that, my advice would be don't. But if you're going to, really look into it. So white papers is more of a promise of what their goal is, what they want to do, what their vision is of their altcoin. Um, and just, there's no promise behind it. It's almost like Kickstarter where you can give them money, you can buy the ICO, but they might just you know fail tomorrow and all the money's gone. Um, but it's kind of their, it's a, it's their vision and it's what they want to do with this new coin that they're creating. And an ICO is kind of like an initial public offering that exists in stock markets, which can be risky even for really big companies. If you remember Facebook, when it started on the stock market, it tanked for like the first month. And a lot of people lost a, month, a lot of money buying Facebook stock. So even if you believe in a coin, sometimes it can tank for absolutely no reason. Market capitalization is a metric that a lot of uh, people use to rank coins. All it really is is just the price times the supply. And it's the circulating supply, which is the estimate of the coins that could ever be accessed. So they tried to eliminate when people like had Bitcoin wallets and they threw their hard drives in the dump. They try to account for that, figure out how many Bitcoins were lost. And market cap is based on that supply. So one of the things that we kind of glossed over that kind of relates to what Rob was talking about in terms of the difficulty um, of, so I think Rob and Guy mentioned that over time, the difficulty of solving these uh, puzzles to, to verify the next block increases and the reward decreases. Um, for most coins, there is a certain hard cap of how many coins there can be. For example, for Bitcoin, it's 21 million? 21 million, yeah. 21 million something, which means that after 21 million, 
Bitcoins that cannot be anymore. It's hard coded directly into the code. Um, for and, other and Bitcoin was distributed through money, as as are a lot of coins, especially forks of Bitcoin. But for some coins choose to just sell their coins on exchanges. Right. For for other currencies, there necessarily is there isn't necessarily hard cap. For example, Ethereum, there is no set hard cap. They release periodically um, some new amount of ether to the general public that can be traded uh, and used so on. And the reason why we're using certainty supply here is that certain companies or certain technologies, they like to keep a portion of their, or they want to keep a portion of their, uh, of their currency as kind of uh, as a show of goodwill, if you will. Right? For example, Ripple, I think, holds like 600 million XRP for themselves, which means that they believe in their own technology and they want to see it succeed. So they have kind of a stake in making it succeed. If they make their uh, cryptocurrency successful, then they'll be even richer. And also, sometimes a company will use it as a reserve of backup funds to run things like servers and their website and all that. So there are coins that aren't, you said aren't distributed, are created through mining? They're pre-created and then sold to people who are all in time. So the internals of the system are all still, everything's all validated. And yeah. yeah, but the initial so distribution is people pay for them instead of mining them for free. But you also said some of them, some of these altcoins don't even have currently implemented technology. Yeah, like sometimes the coins will exist, but like the wallets won't exist, or like um, the network won't have enough uh, miners or people staking the coin if that's what it takes. It, it's more that whatever they send the white paper isn't necessarily fully carried. For example, there are a lot of coins still they exist. Yeah, they pre-generated oh, the coins. Yeah, the coins that exist. kind of centralized. It's just these people that made this platform are selling these things they created. Yep, that's why it's so it's not it's super risky. in that sense because they don't control all the coins and they don't control the price the coins are being traded for. And, okay. Yeah. Uh, they, they are they are the creators behind the technology. It's similar how Bitcoin itself is decentralized. There's a creator behind the technology, but the the technology itself is decentralized. So some all coins, I think I mentioned this, provide passive income. Neo and Neo, Neo produces Neo gas when you have it, um, and it's just payment for not spending it, like it's in stock. Uh, Neo is also another platform coin like Ethereum. And this is really popular. Yeah. We briefly talk about we briefly talk about staking as well, where uh, some technologies are looking to the idea behind staking, where if you own a certain amount of coins. And you choose to stake it, which means that instead of mining, we'll be uh, using these coins as a way to determine which block is next. Then you can receive a set amount of dividends after X. <coughs> and briefly, um, most altcoins, at least the established ones, have their own wallets. There are also multi wallets, which um, will be a single program, but you can store some number of different coins on it to help you. Uh, be better organized than having lots of separate wallets. There's also portfolio trackers. So if you actually care about the value of the coins, which means you're trading them as opposed to using them, um, there's apps that you put in the amount that you have and it just tells you the number of your total portfolio, the amount of it. That's it. Great. Thanks for attending. And, uh, Hopefully you learned something out of it. And again, this is a very basic idea or very basic introduction to cryptocurrencies. 